So Alex, what is your real motivation to becoming successful in your movies and theatre and all that? Well, it's a very good question. And um, one of the, the, the important things for me about the arts is that I want to be a big enough celebrity to be invited to the Pebble Beach Pro-Am <laughs> and therefore get to play with Tiger Woods, who won the US Masters, of which I'm very happy. Uh, as you know, we went to a technical run at 7.30 in the morning on Monday morning mm -hmm. and I had no sleep because <laughs> I was that excited, having watched the whole thing. So that's the real motivation. And let me tell you, you're serious, I know. Yeah, I am very yeah, serious. Absolutely I couldn't serious. Couldn't care less about the arts. That's right. I couldn't care less. <laughs> I just want to be a celebrity. Hell, I'm, I'm, I'm actually interested in maybe going on maths. What's maths? Married at first sight. Oh. When I become a celebrity, then I could get invited to the celebrity golf tournament. <laughs> you so nothing to do with the movie. I have no, I have no interest in storytelling. It's all, it's all, a, it's all a fraud. It's, it's all a ruse. It's all just so you can get invited to the golf tournament. That, that's it. Okay. At least I'm being honest. You are. Alex, for people who don't know the background of me and my left brain, how did, how did it go from paper, like on script, and, and arrive now to the big screens? Um, basically, um, we did a film, as you know, Alex and Eve. Mm -hmm. um, that was a much bigger budgeted film. Um, and it was quite an exhaustive process. It took us six years to get that up. And I just felt from an economical point of view, from a time efficiency point of view, it just took too long. I didn't want to wait six years to make another movie. Um, There's a lot of meetings, a lot of setbacks, etc. So then I thought, I need to now change the model um, rather than making a big budget film or bigger budget for Australian standards, make a real low budget movie and um, that way it'd be easier to raise the money, uh, much quicker to raise the money, the turnaround time would be much quicker and obviously I uh, mean my left brain, uh, when I'd first thought about that, about a guy trying to fall asleep, I knew that the cast would be quite small, um, the production values wouldn't require a lot of money so I thought this was the ideal movie to make on this lower budget, lower, lower budget platform in order to get it done relatively quickly. And the turnaround time was very quickly because raising the money for a low budget movie was, was pretty quick. Um, and I think I began pre-production in uh, early uh, 2017. Right. Um, we shot October 2017 and finished it around September 2018, thereabouts. So the actual filming process in was it October? Yes. Yes. So how how many days of filming was there? I think we shot for 13 days. 13 days. Yeah. Right. And I gave a talk recently uh, on Monday night um, about the process and it was all in the pre-production. You know, it was so well planned, so well rehearsed yeah. that the actual shooting of it, we had no no time. The budget couldn't afford us to to be mucking around and go over time, etc. We had to be quite strict with our time. It was the pre-production that allowed that to happen. And I think I remember reading you um, writing things like, for those who really want to learn about filmmaking and directing and that, mm. this is the way oh, to learn about it. Look, I mean, there's, there's varying views on, you know, how the best way to learn, you know, there's, there's film school, that's one path, and there's making a film, that's another path. Now, you know, I got a crash course in filmmaking that I don't know if uh, I would have got you know, yeah, a one year of film school, I don't know, I haven't been to film school, but I can tell you what, I learned a hell of a lot in that very first year, mm. uh, the, the, the three weeks of shooting yeah. our film. I learned an enormous amount. Mm. I had no choice to. Yeah, you had to. Well, actually, I was behind the scenes just observing a lot of the stuff as well, and I, I was amazed at how much I learned yeah. as well. Yeah, and the from one observation. Yeah, the one big thing I learned because I was on no sleep, I was averaging about two hours sleep a day. Right. Um, the one big thing I learned is after a long day shooting and you can't sleep and it's three o'clock in the morning, don't go down and try and watch the rushes right. because you then get mortified. Okay. Because the rushes is the raw footage and you're on no sleep, you've got all these doubts in your head already, and watching the rushes on no sleep with no sound, um, you know, mm. not cut together, no sound design, I wanted to run when I saw it. Right. So for those who don't know what rushes are, because not everyone's behind the scenes in filmmaking, yeah. um, so the rushes are the raw it's footage. It's the raw footage of what you shot that particular day. Right. You know, so... So you've got to have, obviously, you'd have to then look at those rushes 
looking at it at the bigger picture. Understanding that it's going to get cut together, it's going to be sound design, music is going to put, be put on. Right. You know, for example, there's one scene where my character is just looking at a computer screen and all you're seeing is my eyes, nothing else. Right. Now, if you watch that out of context, yeah. it's as boring as can be. <laughs> but of course, when you look at, when you cut to what mm. he's looking at, and you put a little lace of music over it, and you hear the clack, the, the clicking of the um, of uh, the pressing of the keyboard, right. and all of a sudden the scene comes to life. Makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, with your cast, like, how did it come to selecting the cast? With me being in the movie, um, and me, I've got a lot of experience in the theatre, um, but not a lot of experience on screen. Um, so I'd consider myself as an actor on screen, an emerging actor. Um, I needed, being my first film that I was directing, I needed to get an experienced cast around me. Um, and I'd met Rachel Beck um, at a previous stage show of mine and I just loved her energy. Her energy was great and I, and I felt that she embodied the energy that the, the character of Vivian has. So I just rang her up and said, look, I've got this, this role for you. I didn't audition her. Um, I just felt that she embodied that energy and I just said, read the script, let me know if you're in. Mm. She read the script and you know, two days later she said, I'm in, um, which was great. And we just put this great rapport. And with Mal, you know, I met Mal, we're supposed to have a half hour, Mal Kennard, we're supposed to have a half hour meeting. Um, he plays Ivan Malat in, in, in Catching Malat, the TV series, and got nom nominated for Logie um, for that. And, and that's very intense, intense. drama. And mm -hmm. he plays the left side of my character's brain. Mm. He's kind of got almost caught in a, in a metaphoric jail, so to speak. Mm. And I thought, oh, that would be quite interesting. Then I met Mal. It was supposed <laughs> to be a half hour meeting. Yeah. Well, three hours later, we were still talking. <laughs> right. And we just got this energy, this, 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 you can't, this mm. chemistry you can't, you can't really, you can't teach it, you can't, you can't contrive it. Mm. It just happened. And that's when I walked out of there thinking, okay, there's, here's my left brain, because we wow. just had this great chemistry. It was a half hour meeting that went for three hours. And he's the one that also recommended and backed me to direct the film, which right. is lovely, absolutely lovely. That's fantastic. Yeah. And then you had Laura Dundavich. Then, uh, sorry, Chantelle Barry oh, then Chantel came on Barry. board. She lives in LA. Um, and what I liked about the casting of um, uh, Chantelle Barry is, you know, there's this discussion about uh, you know, people of a called background are only cast because of their called background in that particular role. Mm -hmm. You know, a Greek, you know, you gotta, let's go get a Greek, playing a, a, a woggy Greek. And with this film, I just wanted to cast who I think was great for the part. It didn't matter what their cultural identity no. was. Mm -hmm. And that's what she did, and she was great. She, she kind of portrayed this stoicism, which was just quite lovely, this kind of, playing her cards close to her chest, a bit of a poker face. Right. Um, and she embodied that and she was great. And, and Chantel flew out from... She flew out from LA. From yeah, LA to yeah, do the movie. To do the movie, yeah. And she was just fantastic to deal with. The mm. cast were great. So having the experienced cast mm. um, allowed me to let them do what, what they're good at. Yeah. So I didn't have to worry about holding their hand mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. You know, in fact, I was learning from them. Yeah. Which is really good. And then who did you have, who, who would you say in your other cast? Sorry, then we got Laura Dundavich. Yeah. Um, I had um, had some dealings with Laura Dundavich previously, um, potentially for a stage show, and um, I felt like she would, the role that I had her in mind for, I thought that she would do a really good job with it. Um, and we, she auditioned, and she, her audition was fantastic. And then we met, and I just thought, yeah, fantastic. She, she'd fit this role really well. And the actual, um, uh, there was one scene we did with her which was fantastic. And I think when people see it, they'll see how, how strong she is. Um, she's very, very strong in it. And quite frankly, she leads the scene really well. Um, and her being taller uh, really helped. It's really funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the dynamics is really yeah, yeah, yeah. it really it's works great, very yeah. very well. Yeah, she's great. So and you know what? Mm -hmm. What well, she understood comedy enough to know, and one of the big mistakes actors make with comedy is they know their lines are funny, and then they play for funny. Right. Where she played them straight. 
mm. which is great. And the timing. The timing, yeah. Timing it's just paper straight, truthful, truthful, truthful. Truthful timing. And the comedy mm. comes out of that truth. Yes. And then you have, who's next? Paul Miskimmon, mm -hmm. who's been, as you know, he's been in, in many of our stage shows mm -hmm. and he steals the show with his with his cameo role. That's Fantastic. Hilarious. He's hilarious in it. Oh. Um, Sal Shara, who's been in our stage shows, um, um, he, he plays. Um, Sal Shara well. was my on stage hubby. Hubby in, in Alex, Alex and Eve. Stage yes. shows. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, yeah, so we've got a pretty good little ensemble that came together. And are we going to give. Oh, yeah, I forgot Natalia. to mention. Natalia, who. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you what her role yeah, is. Yeah, we can't talk it's about a twist. But we have Natalia. Natalia La La Ladico or Ladica, right. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how she pronounces it. She's fantastic. She's been in my stage shows as well. Right. Um, so she was lovely to work with. And of course, if I may. Oh, mention moi. Moi. <laughs> uh, I love my name in the movie. My name's Linda. Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, Thank you. Definitely played against type. <laughs> <laughs> I think Alex, I think you wrote that scene Specifically knowing for you. that I would. And Simon Brooks McLaughlin, who I yeah. must oh, say. Simon. Can I tell you a little anecdote about champion. Simon? He's a champion. A little anecdote. Um, I, my, me and my wife have been together for eight years now, over eight years. Mm -hmm. But on our six month anniversary, mm -hmm. um, I surprised her with going to see a musical. Right. right? Jersey Boys. Yes. And we've gone to see this musical and we didn't know what to expect. We loved it. We loved it. We just came out of there and we just loved the musical. What we didn't know was that about a year and a half later, um, I got introduced to Simon McLaughlin, who was in the musical. He's excellent. Right? Mm -hmm. And anyway, lo and behold, here we are, you know, several years later, and we got to work together in, in my in film. The movie. You know, and he gave us so much joy on our six month anniversary in his performance mm. of um, uh, Jersey Boys, I just thought it was quite a nice touch that here we are now. That's right. Yeah. You just never know, do you? Yeah. You just don't know what you know, yeah. things are happening. It was great. It was a lovely touch. Yeah. And um, you've also um, just just the, the whole left brain thing. Like there's some really, really good scenes. I'm telling you, there's some very good scenes. Um, a couple that spring into my mind, the one with uh, Rachel Beck, I can't say too much because we don't want to give anything away, but Rachel Beck walks in at an op opportunistic oh, right. moment. Yeah. <laughs> we hence, can't give too much away. <laughs> hence the rating of the film, M, crude sexual humour. Right, okay. <laughs> and, um, and then there's some good scenes with um, Simon McLaughlin and... Yeah. Uh, Chantel Barry. Yeah, yeah we can't give too much away there. Um, I'm curious to know what our camera operator thought of that particular scene or the two crude sexual humour scenes. And then, <laughs> and then there's the other funny, another funny scene which I'm thinking of is the one with um, Rachel Beck, Paul Miskimmon in the middle. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, That's still a show. and you. It's like, very good. There's some very, very, very funny, like the, the whole film just comes together quite nicely but we just can't give too much away at this point yeah look i mean the idea of the left brain you know mm. i think we all have an inner critic you know who's who just eat, eats at our confidence a little bit who second guesses any choices we make um you know so i wanted to explore that inner yeah. critic and the role the inner critic can play on our lack of decision making um well you call it an inner critic i i i think of it as like i've always got these different it's almost like you've got different voices in your head. Yeah. And so there's this voice that keeps you, know, you want to do something and it's like, oh, should I or shouldn't yeah. I? You're and not good enough. Yeah. You're, like, you're not this. How it's a, a confidence yeah. thing. It's also a critical yeah. thing. It's this critical left yeah. brain that's Why like... Why you want to go out with you? You're a loser. You're this, you're that. And, you know, all those mm -hmm. different um, explorations of those inner voices and also when you are down your inner voice also can lift you up yes you know come on yes. don't get down so it's not that bad or whatever so you've always got that little inner conflict and there's this this kind of almost counterbalancing mm. of your, your inner voices you know when you are up can knock you down or when you are down can knock you down and when you are down can sometimes just lift you lift you that up. inner voice you know mm. and we've all I think we've all got that yeah I think especially in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, 
you're kind of doing a stock take of your life, you know, your mm. career, your financial position, mm. your personal life, you know, how you're viewed in the world. You kind of do that because what do you do? You're just tossing and turning, trying to go to sleep. Mm. And then you go and you can go to some very dark places mm. um, when you're in that, you know, two yeah. o'clock in the morning mm. staring at a, you know, black ceiling. Mm. And you can really eat yourself up doing that. Yeah. And that's what we try to explore. But one of the other things we try to explore in the film, um, whilst it is a light-hearted romantic comedy, is the idea mm. of friendship love versus romantic love. You right. know, this idea um, of what is love? You know, is love beautiful, fancy restaurants with dim lighting and beautiful um, setting? Or is it, you know, that best friend who is there by your side, yes. you know, while you get you know, eating takeaway and, and you're just talking about your day and yeah. how your day was, you know, the mm. mundane. I mean, what is it? Yeah. You know, what is true love? What is enduring love? And I try to explore that um, within the film. And you've also, like like you said, you go from it being dark to being very, very funny and very entertaining. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. Because I think it, uh, I love the energy in the film because, you know, and the, it's almost like there's several times where, and this is another thing that people can relate to, is like, it's almost like that feeling of when reality hits you in the face and then it just takes something to just give you that kick and that mm. inner voice can just spruce you up sometimes. I hope so, yeah, I hope that's yeah. what it does, you know. One of the one of the objectives I had with this film, um, we've been putting on theatre for 12 years um, and our most successful stage show was Alex and Eve. And Alex and Eve was very funny and was so good to us and became a film in 2015. But it relied on, the comedy it relied on were ethnic stereotypes, um, you know, what, what's commonly known now as ethnic comedy. And it relied on those broad brush strokes of the ethnic stereotypes. Mm -hmm. With this film, I wanted to try to tell a comedy that didn't rely on any ethnic stereotypes. It's easy, those, that, those broad brush strokes are quite easy. I mean, easy, you know, relatively speaking. But with this comedy, I wanted to say, right, I'm gonna try and tell a comedy mm -hmm. that just relies on the situation that the characters are in and who they are as people, not just their cultural background and using that as your backdrop for your comedy. Right. We did that with Alex and Eve and it's such a big part of how I am identified. Mm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be able to say, hey, I can also mm. you know, um, write a story that doesn't rely on those archetypes, which yeah. I guess we've seen now quite a lot from a variety of storytellers. Right. And then you've also got like some other little cameo roles. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Chris. Oh yes, Chris, Chris, who's also been in our stage yes. shows. So Chris Argyrus. Chris Argyrusus. Chris Argyrusus. So yes, he's been in our stage shows. Or yeah. The, and he's actually played my partner in a few yes. of those stage shows yes. as well. And he's, he appears early in the movie and um, I don't know if you remember, but there's a shot that we hold, after he speaks with the main character, there's a shot that we hold on him in his, you know, blue, blue power suit, mm -hmm. um, his wife who actually is my wife, um, uh, is... Hi, Wajia. Yeah. <laughs> um, with her and their, and their little one playing on the swings and they're on their mobile phones, the symbol of the modern, successful family, family. both in their blue power suits, both with their, with their child, you know, embodying success. Right. And obviously Arthur doesn't have any of that. Yes. Um, and Chris embodies that, you know, he's better looking than Arthur, he's in a suit, He's, you know, got the wife, he's got the child, he's got everything that perhaps Arthur would like. He's a real estate mogul. A real, real estate mogul, yes. And then you've also got in the casting scene? Sal Sharar. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, Marina Ahmed, mm -hmm. who um, is, also, is my sister's, uh, my wife's sister. Yes. Um, and it, so it's a family affair. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, no, there's some very, very, very funny moments. Very good. Okay, it's me and my left brain. Did you do some research or prepare? How did you prepare for this um, particular character role of, of the left brain? Did you actually research? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. I, I did a lot of research understanding the science mm -hmm. of the right brain and the left brain. Um, the left brain kind of representing the more logical, more practical, more pragmatic side of us. Right. Um, so I did a lot of work researching the scientific aspect of it. So what does the right brain do? The right brain is more kind of exploring the creative 
side of us. Oh right, whereas yeah, the left brain is the more pragmatic, the more the more logical side. Logical, critical. Yeah. And if right, you remember okay. in the film, you know, uh, Mal is always being practical and pragmatic, mm. and you know, any time Arthur waves, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great speech he gives about Thomas Edison, you know, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. So I did a lot of research on that, yeah. um, but I also did research looking at myself. So what I would do is right. I'd catch myself when I was going through, I guess, difficult time in my life. I'd almost have this other camera lens right. recording my inner thoughts while I was going through them. Okay. You know, like, oh my gosh, look at the... the, the dialogue I just had with myself right now mm -hmm. you're driving yourself mad you know so then yes. I kind of so I had a, almost a third eye looking into my own head wow you know mm. uh, understanding the role that my own voice is playing in my own head my own mm. doubt my own uh, uh, self-criticism and my sabotage because yeah. we all have that sabotaging quality within us I think I think people I think what's interesting with this left brain, the whole uh, imagery of it all and what goes on in our minds is that quite often we just take for granted that you can be talking like to a friend and getting their advice, but we sometimes just don't realise how much we actually do talk to, we're basically mm. talking to ourselves, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. It's that whole exploration of of questioning yourself and doubting yeah. yourself and all of that so it's like constant Absolutely. that constant i agree should i shouldn't i and a lot of the what times, do i do yeah and a lot, yeah. Of the a lot of the times what we do is we will then speak to a friend mm. to to confirm what we want to do to validate what, yes. we, what, what yeah. our left brain or our inner critic has said or not said mm. rather than really open up yes. to listen to what we're going to do what we're going to do. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what anybody tells us. That's right. That's you know, either they're going to kind of jump on what we're, what we're already planning to do yes. or, or, or not. So you're so. not necessarily asking their no, advice and acting no. on their advice. You're looking no. for some sort of validation. What's the biggest mistake men make? You know, when a woman, you know, in a relationship, when a woman says, you know, I've gone to work, and blah, 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 and what do you think I should do? Well, why don't you just do this, honey? <laughs> you know, you're gone, yeah, right? Yeah. You're I gone. Providing advice. Yes. You don't listen to me. You, know. you just want, yes, they just want someone to listen to. You just yeah. want, yeah, and just, just agree. Yeah. Agree. Agreeing is a very good thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, Alex, for me and my left brain, so where can the audience and where can people um, buy tickets? How can they get tickets? And yeah, when is it on? Okay, yeah. so um, we are in cinemas on the 16th of May on a limited uh, cinematic release across Australia. Um, and we're having, we're, we're, we're kind of disrupting the status quo. Yes. We're having a world uh, premiere day, that is. A world premiere day. Yes, yes. world premiere day. That mm -hmm. is at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a morning premiere at GU Filmhouse in Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills Cinemas in Sydney. In Sydney, um, and there's going to be, you know, some uh, morning tea for everybody there, and a red carpet, and media wall, and all those lovely things. Mm -hmm. And then at 7 p.m. or 6:15 p.m. is the red carpet arrivals oh, here see. at Randwick Reads for the big, massive um, world premiere. We're playing in their big 800-seat cinema. Um, so hopefully, we can fill it all up. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and ho hopefully, people. The tickets are $17, uh, so please do get them. Um, and then we, we're doing some special event screenings throughout the first week. The right. first week is really important for a film of this size. Mm -hmm. On Friday night, we're going to have a Q&A at GU Film House um, in, in Beverly, Beverly Hills, Hills. 7 15 pm. That's Friday night. Mm -hmm. And then on Sunday night mm -hmm. at 6 30 pm, we're going to have another Q&A screening here at Randwick Greets post, post film. Right. Um, but all the details, all the information on where, on and, and session times, etc. Uh, can be had at me and my left brain movie.com. I'll repeat that again me and my left brain movie.com. So me and my left brain movie.com. And then when you click on there, it has all the different cinemas that it's yes. showing around Australia. Around Australia, yes. yes. And it's at this stage, it's on the 16th, 17th, 18th, 18th and 19th, 19th of, of May. May. And really, it is up to the audience. Oh, in relation to whether it plays a second, third, and fourth week. You know, if audience don't go in the first week, mm -hmm. cinemas will just Monday morning look at the box office results mm -hmm. of all movies, and the ones that don't perform well, they just pull it. 
So we need to we really, need people really to go get on the people. First wave. Yeah, so absolutely. support Australian cinema. Hashtag yes. support Australian cinema. And this is <coughs> it. So it's in cinemas on the 16th of May. And I like the poster. Actually, I like the photo. It's good. It's coming I think out it's, good. I think it's really good. I think it's really clever. I think it really encapsulates what it's all about. So here we've got the lovely Rachel Beck, Alex Lycos, Mal Kennard. We've got Laura Dundevich, Chantel Barry, Rachel Beck again. And if I may be so bold yeah. as to say, or so indulgent as to say, the quote from our first reviewer, genuine comedy gold. Genuine comedy gold. It's a real fun rom-com, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think so. It asks some interesting questions, but in a light-hearted manner. Right. But it does ask some deeper philosophical questions. And I have to say, I have to say, there were some parts in it when, when I see it that I can see there's this Woody Allen edge happening. Yeah. But I can also see a bit of Hugh Grant coming oh. in there. <laughs> yes. I don't know, that's not for me. <laughs> Shall look, we have tea? Yeah. Yes. Look, look um, <laughs> obviously, obviously, one of my favourite romantic comedies of all time is Annie Hall. Um, you know, Manhattan. I love those films. They, they, they are absolute brilliant movies and I've been inspired by uh, Woody Allen's work so there's definitely a Woody Allen flavour to the work and I, if, I, if I may say as well um, the commentary from people who have seen the movie has been the soundtrack. The soundtrack has been made by Cesare Skabuski wow. who, who is an award-winning composer who did the music for um, Red Dog and the Sapphires Brilliant, brilliant. And yes. it's all jazz? All jazz. It's an all jazz score. Wow. Very Woody Allen. Okay. And if you love, and you know what's great about it, the main character um, is quite morose at the beginning. Right. And the, the jazz is quite muted. And then just slowly, slowly, you know, it, it, it builds and builds and the music just builds to a massive crescendo, big band. It's just fantastic. The, the composer's great. done an extraordinary job. And I had such a great working relationship with him. We went down to Melbourne right. um, mm. to uh, record the music yes. and it was just the most lovely experience that, that we had down in Melbourne, you know, making music for a film. It was just great. Fantastic. And it's going to be, um, as I said, it's going to be released, I don't know if I said this, but it's going to be released April 22nd oh, April and it's going 22nd. to be available, yes, and it's going to be available on iTunes and Spotify. So released the music score music will be released on April 22nd on iTunes and Spotify. Yes. Right, it's fantastic. And if I just may plead to the camera one more time, <laughs> you know, um, we're going through a bit of a tough time right now with cinema. We are competing against, you know, Uber Eats and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, Netflix and Stan. That's what we're competing against. You know, it's so much easier to sit in, order in, and just watch a TV series. And that's, what, and that's really challenging for us as independent filmmakers. So we do plead, um, give, give the experience of, of going to watch an independent film a go. Um, I promise you, you will have a great time, um, a great experience. I love going to the cinema. I love the experiential nature of it. And if I may ask you all to please give our film a go in the first week, so at least we have a chance to survive a second and hopefully a third week. Please. Hopefully I've begged enough. <laughs> do you want me to get on my knees? I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excuse to go out and just have some fun. Thank you, Alex. No, thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you very much. We'll see you on the screen. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs>